This is, uh, this is how the river rises, by the way. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff, right? So, and you know, during Florence, how many meals we went out? We had the crews out and uh, cutting trees off roofs and cleaning up, so I just thank the Lord. Well, praise God. Let me shift here. If you'll, uh, wow, that's pretty hot. Do I sound loud? I do, huh? Wow, praise God. Okay. Um, if you'll uh, pull out your handout, this is going to be part two from, uh, from last week, and um, I just have learned so much applicably from the story of Gideon and what was going on, and I saw so many parallels uh, with where we are currently in our own nation and what's going on in the earth. And so I... Uh, as we have, we're about to, uh, today is our last day of the 21-day prayer fast that we've been on, and I, I thank you for praying for the outpouring of the Spirit. I believe, you know, we had uh, Jack Taylor and Leif Hetland here a while back, and they, they kind of inspired us to move forward. And uh, if you're ever free on Wednesday mornings from 9 to 10.30, we do our prayer time intercession, and that's where we really get assignments from God. And this past Wednesday was powerful. And I believe the Lord downloaded some things. We're still in the process of unpacking that. But it's laid out for us the remaining seven months of this year what we're going to be doing, going out, prayer walking. Uh, the Lord has been, I've been before Him. I spent four hours on a tractor the other day cutting some grass, and the Lord was just downloading to me some things, and I'm just uh, asking Him to confirm it. So, And then when Patricia came in, came in town Friday night, River of Life, and some of that impart, uh, impartation that came down. So I am really excited about what God is about to do. We've got teams out this morning. We've got some at Northwood Church. We've got another team up at a Burgaw Church. So God is just, He's just doing it, making a lot of connections. And um, we want to get on board. So please, you can take one Saturday a quarter and do something for somebody. Amen? So please sign up on the way out. Let's, let's get behind this and... We want to have more than just rhetoric behind our desire to help people. All right. Um, remember the scripture in Hebrews 12. Did you memorize it? Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, Wherefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Um, I'm going to just read it to you. I, I believe there's so much in this particular set of verses. So let's just proclaim it together. Why don't we stand? We're going to declared, if you've meditated on this as, um, over the last three weeks, this is really just powerful on how we move forward. So let's just say this together. Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you, Lord. Have a seat. Interesting set of scriptures there that we are compassed about by a great cloud. I love it. All right, if you'll uh, pull out your hand out, when they cried out to the Lord, it began. This is part two. If you look at the first paragraph there, Israel did evil in the, in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. That's important. I want you to focus on that. I mentioned this last week. The enemy attacked and stole from Israel until they had been reduced to a starving and fearful people. When they cried out to the Lord, he sent a prophet to reveal their sin. Then he sent an angel, see the progression, to raise up a humble deliverer named Gideon. First the Lord needed to test Gideon and to rid the idolatry and the witchcraft and the generational sin from Gideon's family. He then gives Israel a choice, repent and turn from your idolatry and your rebellion against God. That national choice set in motion for God to take possession of Gideon. 
the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon to raise up Gideon to rescue Israel from many enemies. The war against the enemies requires hearing the word of the Lord, being obedient, hearing the Lord's strategy, overcoming fear, and not leaning on your natural understanding. Their obedience destroys the overwhelming enemies and establishes 40 years of peace in the land. Wouldn't you like to find 40 years of peace where the politics would stop, all the craziness would go, all the racial divide, all that? Wouldn't it be nice? Well, there's a progression, and there's a national choice that's actually set before us. We're going to look at the three principalities that have actually come against the three Canaanite principalities that came against Israel are the same principalities that are coming against the United States. And there's a choice. It's going to come in the next election, and it's going to come with what we do with what we hear from the Word of God. So let's learn some of the amazing lessons about Gideon's promises from the Lord. First of all, God, this is not in your handout, God delights to advance the humble. He just likes to find the weak things and raise them up. So God delights to advance the humble. God hears our cries. Sometimes you don't think so, but he does. When we know that this scripture, remember 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, not the people that are out there that know nothing about God, 25% of the U.S. right now has no understanding of God. Most of them are atheists. But if my people called by my name, the Christ ones, the Christians, will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, then I will heal their land. I'll hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. That is the prescription for why we've got to pray and we've got to seek God. Amen? So he says, look, he just loves to hear our cries. I like this part too, and when you feel like a zero, God can make you a hero. Don't you like that? Gideon felt like, man, I am nothing. I am the least of the least, the smallest of the tribe of all of that. And he says, yeah, okay, you're the, you're the one I'm going to use. <laughs> when God calls you and you say yes, he makes it so. When God calls you and you say yes, <laughs> he makes it so. And so, I'm glad that God is able to do this. So let me ask this. How is your training of hearing the Lord? If you're going to hear the Lord to operate in the Spirit, and we've been doing this uh, teaching on Wednesday nights, equipping in the prophetic, which we just will finish up this Wednesday, hearing the voice of God is, important, is probably the, the most important part. So let me ask you, how are you hearing in your, in your thoughts with God? How are you doing in that? If the... Sheep hear my voice. Another question is, how's your sheep walk doing? You know, I really don't like goats. My daughter and son, they have goats. I just, they, they eat the fruit trees. They get out of the place. They do it. No, oh, I, I don't like goats, right? And I understand why the Lord doesn't like them either. He says he's going to separate the goats and the sheep. So the question is, how is your sheep walk doing? That sounds, that sounds like a humble, they're, they're like really follow the shepherd. Yeah, that's exactly what he wants us to do. So humble ourselves in that place. Hearing the voice of God, this is just for me. Um, I heard this years and years ago from a pastor named Nicky Gumbel. He calls them the five CSs, but it's circumstantial signs. It's kind of when things start to line up, doors open, it's like, huh? When those things start to align circumstantially, that might be the Lord doing something. You're going to see that circumstantially, Gideon used a fleece. He said, if I'm really hearing from you, God, now I don't know about you, but somehow taking a sheep's fleece and putting it in a wine press and then asking God, one day put the dew on it and it'll be all wet and the ground will be dry, and then the next night flip it around the other way, the ground will be dry and the fleece will be wet, vice versa. He goes, I don't that, that works for you, Gideon? Okay. That, whatever works for you. But I've, I have fleeced the Lord. Some people say, I don't believe in fleeces. Well, it's in the book. And God works with us sometimes when we have about this much faith. God, if I'm really hearing you, if this is really you, God, then, then do this, right? How about the guy who moved the sundial, right? Move the sun back. 
Hello? Yeah, that, that, now that's a fleece. <laughs> In fact, the scientists have even proved it's so. <laughs> In the chronological clock, somehow it stopped. Anyway, God is able to do exceeding. So, circumstantially, doors can open. Timing. This commanding scripture just jumps out. Now, it can be an angel. How about the Word of God? The scripture that jumps out. In this case, we had an angel show up. And then later, you'll see from this, the Lord showed up and told him what to do. Words of knowledge. Counsel from the saints. In Gideon's time, his dad, after God told him, he says, we got to take care with your generational sin that's in your family. You've got Baal worship going on and Asherah worship going on. Asherah is the goddess of the Canaanites. She's the immoral one. They worshiped her. They had temple prostitutes. In, so that's the sexual immorality spirit. It is a principality that is over the United States. It's running rampant. That spirit, that principality, that Canaanite god of Asherah, and then there's a parallel God that goes with it, Baal. He was the prosperity God. He was the one that says, if you'll worship me, you'll bow down to me, you'll sacrifice to me, I will promise you seven years of prosperity. Seven is a big number because that's the same number that when, jo- when Gideon was told, I want you to kill your father's bull. I want you to go cut down the immoral pole of Asherah and I want you to cut it up and I want you to burn it on the altar there. I want you to take your daddy's bull that was born seven years ago when God brought the judgment against them in the Canaanites for seven years. Big deal. God says, that bull was born when you guys started worshiping all that stuff. And when I brought judgment, so you want me to cut this and break it off? Bring your daddy's bull. What does the bull represent? Prosperity, the bull market. It's this whole thing of pursuit of wealth in the United States. It's the love of money. It's another principality. Immorality and the principality of searching after wealth, selling everything for for what? At the end of this thing, you can't take it with you. And then the third principality was Molech, another Canaanite god. It is the child sacrifice. It's that same spirit of the child abortion that's in our nation now for convenience or whatever you want to dress it up to look like. It's murder. And it was the sacrifice of children. And those three principalities are in the United States. And if we want to see God heal this land with all the trillions of debt, what does Deuteronomy 28 tell us? He says, you will be blessed in your fields and in your homes. If you will follow me, if you'll stay after me, you do these things, I will bless you. But if you do not and you forget your God, then I will come after your children. I'll come after your wealth. You will not be a one who borrows and you'll be one who lends. Well, where are we now? We're a borrowing nation because we have lost our way. But God is just saying, look, I'm not depressed about this. All You're going to find out God took 300. He sent the 32,000 home. And he said, give me 300 who are devoted and dedicated, and I'll move this thing. That's all he requires. I'm not hung up on numbers. It's a matter of fact, you can do a lot more with a small SEAL team sometimes and a big army. All right, so when we look at this, this Asherah pole has got to come down. That is the Canaanite immorality, the Baal worship. So what does he do? He tells him, I want you to go and take care of your stuff first. So he tells him, let's pick up, go to Judges chapter 6. And I'm going to finish this today, praise God. 6-1, 6-1, I read this last, I'm just going to quickly hit, so for those who might not have been here, get us back on. The Israelites, 6-1, it, Judges 6-1, this is the time of the judges in Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and he handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel, they came, they stole all their stuff. They were so numerous, it says in verse 6, too numerous to count. They'd come on raiding parties, and they would steal everything, make it bare. The Israelites cried out, verse 7, when they, when, that's interesting, when they cried out, are you crying out? Open your mouth. When you cry out, the Lord, because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet. He's a no-name prophet. I like this. And he exposes their wickedness. He tells you, I told you, go back to Deuteronomy, he says, I told you that if you forget the Lord your God and you start worshiping these other principalities of darkness, then I'm going to have to remove your blessing. He says in verse 10, I told you, I am the Lord God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree. I like this. This is their family tree. 
It's Oprah. Oprah was about 16 miles from uh, Jericho. Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat there at the bottom of the wine press. The angel of the Lord appears to a mighty hero. The Lord is with you. This is this prophetic word that he has no concept about. This whole thing about, you know, I'm not really that, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. He doesn't realize this is an angel. He calls him sir, that language there in verse 14. Sir, he's probably a traveler. He's got a staff. He probably shows up. He rests by the tree. He sees Gideon down there in the wine press, and they have this conversation. You're a mighty hero. He goes, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm the smallest guy in my clan. I don't know who his brothers were, but he says, I'm the smallest in my brother's clan, and I am the, we're the smallest clan in all of the tribe. So if that's so, and then he starts complaining the politics are really bad. If God's really there, I heard about all the historical stuff. The rivers, the, you know, the, he opened up the Red Sea. He brought us across the Jordan. He did all, yeah, 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 yeah. You think his faith was activated? No, it was not. All he could see was all the bad stuff. Then he says, he turned to the Lord and he said in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go with strength. You have and Israel and I will use you. I am sending you. You will rescue Israel from the Midianites. But Lord, now he calls him Lord. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue? My clan's the weakest. Gideon replies, if, now I like this, verse 17, if you truly are going to help me, I need you to show me a sign to prove that this is really the Lord. So here's a, give me a sign. <laughs> you came here, I'm starting to think you might be an angel. I'm not sure about all this. If I'm this great hero, you gotta, you gotta show me. But I like what he says is, before you do that, though, let me go make my offering. So he goes and runs home. He kills the goat, praise God. He gets that goat, gets a basket, makes some bread. So this is probably a half a day, all day affair, right? By the time you skin the goat, kill it. Have you ever done that? It's like, good Lord, this is a long time. You're going to cook it, you know? You got to bring it. You got to make the bread. So this is like, the angel's kind of, the, the guy is sitting under the tree the whole day. The angel of the Lord comes, verse 20, he says, when he comes back, he brings the angel under the great tree, the family tree. This is, speaks of legacy. All this is happening at the legacy tree. So I said, find your altar in your house. Find the place where you and your children, your grandchildren, your friends, this is the place where I meet God on a regular basis. It's important, I think. And he says to him, place the meat here, place the bread here, pour this on the rock. Pour and then he says, he takes the staff, verse 21, he takes the staff, he touches it, fire comes up from the rock, consumes it. You think that's a good sign? At that moment, the angel disappears. Now, I want you to get, him, get, get in a picture. Here's Gideon, and he's like, he's worked all day, he's killed the goat, he's brought it here, he's got the bread, he says, I'm going to just go offer this guy. If he's really going to show me a sign, okay. He does what the Lord tells him, to, the angel tells him to do, and then the fire consumes and the guy disappears. Now it's like, do, 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 right? What is that all about? And then he realizes, uh-oh, I have just seen God face to face. <laughs> that God experience does something to Gideon. He's working him. He's, he's allowing this to happen. When Gideon, he didn't have to go home and take the goat. He didn't have to give an offering. He didn't even, he could have said to the guy, yeah, right, get lost. I don't believe what you said. He could have said, he didn't do that. There's a teaching point in that. Where are you? in the invitation of the God experience. Yeah. And so, as soon as that happens, he's like, uh-oh, verse 22, it's all right. The Lord then tells him, you're not going to die. Uh, now the Lord speaks. He says, don't be afraid. You will not die. So what does Gideon do now? He now builds an altar to the Lord, and he calls that place Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. So he's built an offering, and now he's built an altar. Well, in the progression, see what God's doing to him? Watch what happens. The altar remains there. It says, that night, so later on in the evening, the night the Lord comes and says to Gideon, now take the second bull from your father's herd. Not the first bull. See, it matters. How you do this and how you sacrifice matters. Look at the strategy and the timing. It's here. He says, I want you to go pull down your father's altar. Take the seven bull, it's seven, second bull. He's seven years old. Cut down the pole, the Asherah pole, that's beside it. Build an altar to the Lord there. It's on the hilltop sanctuary. It says, in the King James, it says, it's in the ordered place. 
If you ever notice what the covens do, what the secret societies do, they find the high places. Go to Cherokee and look at the Masonic that's there. They find the high places. You go into the mountains in Israel, you'll find the high places is where they go, where Kabbalah and all them, they speak to you. They go to those high places to influence. This is where they project their curses. The covens that are trying to infiltrate churches. I've been in place, I won't name this place right now, but I've been in a place where the covens have infiltrated the staff in churches to bring curses directly upon and to tear down the church of God. And Patricia King Friday, Friday night said the same thing. She just read a, wrote a book that said there's an intentional covens that are now coming to infiltrate the places of God to pull down the curses and destroy the church. But God's going to expose all that. What he says here is Gideon goes and he says, I want you to go to that place, the, the, the place that is selected, and I want you to do this to break this curse. Since your father and the other Israelites, his father was the head. Joash was the head of this particular village. So what does he do? Well, this is strategy. He doesn't go during the day. He doesn't go to dad and say, dad, I'm killing your second bull and I'm going to do this. And what do you think? No, he just, he goes and does what the Lord told him. Don't extract. Well, what about honoring your father? No, dad's probably not going to agree with this. So you go do this. Take 10 of his servants. He says, verse 27, he takes 10 of his servants. He goes at night because he's afraid of the guys in his own father's house and the people of the town. In the morning, they wake up and they find out, whoa, there's a new altar. The, the bull's dead there. The Asher pole's down. You know, when you start messing with people's immorality and their wealth, God's, get ready. There's going to be pushback. They may try to kill you. He comes here, he says, they find it. We want him. They find out, okay, it's, it's Gideon. So they show up at, at, at Joash's father's house Send out your son. He deserves to die. I love what Joash does at this point. The father comes out, and it doesn't say there's any interaction between his son and what happened. All he knows is the mob is outside the house. Send your son out. We're going to kill him. And the father says, you know what? Why don't you let, jo why don't you let Baal defend himself? If Baal is such a wonderful big God, why don't you let Baal defend himself? And I'll tell you what, you touch my son and you'll be dead by morning. That's like, woo -hoo. Daddy got some, he got something going on in there, right? Sometimes the sons and daughters got to tell us, look, this is, you're worshiping the wrong kind of stuff. You're focused on the wrong stuff. And so, Daddy does the right thing. In fact, they change Gideon's name. God is always about name changes. He did it with Abram. He did it with Sarah, right? He does it with Isaac and, you know. He, it's like, come on. So what does he do? He says, we're going to change your name now. In fact, the whole team says, okay, I mean, the whole village says, okay, we won't kill him. Let Baal defend himself. And they change his name. It says, if Baal will defend himself, his new name, let me see if I can say it. It's Jeroboam. Jeroboam, Jeroboam, right? Which means, let Baal defend himself. So every time, in fact, later on, you'll see they call Gideon that name. Let Baal defend himself. Let Baal, it's like every time they call out his name, in fact, when they go to war, they use that name against the Amorites. And so we find out that God just changed his name and says, yeah, every time you call him, let Baal defend himself. He's no defense against a man with God. And so look at the progression. He pulls down the generational sin, the generational witchcraft. He pulls down the immorality the child sacrifice stuff. He pulls it all down. And at that point, look at the timing, verse 33, soon after. Isn't it like that? Soon as God gets his men and women positioned, the enemy rises up. But it's always overplays his hand. Walks them right into the trap. It says, soon after, verse 33, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance. Of course they did. And they came against Israel, crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Boy, if you look at that valley, it is a beautiful valley. There's been so many wars in there. It's unbelievable. Anyway, then the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. King James says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He was under the influence of it, but it's at this point, the sold out man who said, let Baal defend himself, becomes, in fact, some of the translations say, war, God wears Gideon like a glove. Hello? What happens if a man and a woman becomes the one who is clothed in God. 
But look at the progression. It took him to be obedient. He had to put himself at risk. He had to come against his family sin. He had to walk about his own fears. God's not done with him. He says, all right. Now the enemy rises up, and it says the spirit takes possession of Gideon. Then he said, this is interesting. He's, he realizes, uh-oh, we're about ready to go to war. We're about ready to go to war. Then God goes, Gideon says, now, if you're really, really with me, this is the fleece thing, right? Verse 36, if you're with me, you got to prove it to me. He takes the wool fleece, the water's in it, the water's not in it. And he goes, okay, I guess you're with me. I, I kind of like the flashing meat thing better than that, but is that really, did, how did the water get on that? Thing? I, hey, it worked for Gideon. Okay, so that night, Gideon asked again in verse, the last part of chapter 6, verse 40, God confirms it. So Jeroboam, verse 1, chapter 7, here it is. That is Gideon, (laughs) I love it. Jeroboam, let Bel defend himself, and his army got up early. How about that? They get up early. They went as far as the springs of Harod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Now, I like this. He shows up. It turns out they got 32,000 men have now come to fight. And God says, you know what? You're going to think this is all about you. If you get this mega people going together with you, you'll think it's all about you. I'm not having that. Um, So, tell you what, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy 20, verse 8. It says, if they're afraid, send them home. So, he says, how many of you 32,000 are scared? 22,000 raised their hands. (laughs) Okay, guys, all go home. Now, can you imagine being one of Gideon's generals? Like, man, I think I might want to resign at this point, right? (laughs) It's like, he's sending the army home. So you, you 22,000 scare cat, go on home. It's all right, it's all right. Deuteronomy 28 says, if you're afraid, go home. So they go home. Then the Lord says, no, you still got too many. There's still 10,000. That's too many. So then he tries the, uh, the lapping the dog test. I don't know. <laughs> he goes, now he, he commands the 10,000. We're about ready to go to war. If you've ever been in a place where it's dry and you're about ready to fight, you better be hydrated, you better be ready. He says, all 10,000 of you, come on, get a drink. And the Lord says, watch how they drink. And he says, the ones that bow down and send those dudes home. They're not, they're not good. And the ones that go like this, those are the ones. That, wow, what a qualification. That's your SEAL team? <laughs> like, good Lord, God. The, you know, you got you to gotta imagine being Gideon's generals. He's going, the what test? And can you imagine some of the guys with the arms as big as my head? They're the ones that have been in battle. Send them home. They don't drink right. Like, good night, Lord. This is, this is where Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, don't trust in your own thinking, but lean on your under. Don't lean on that understanding. Trust the Lord and do what he says. He'll direct your path. So it gets the army down to 300. Yeah, that's just right. That's good. All right. So he sends the other, others home. And it says now in verse 7, with the 300 men, I will rescue and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the other ones home. So the 300 men with them. <laughs> Whoa. They must have had an anointing because there was something at that point the Lord puts on. Remember, when the Lord calls you and you say yes and you're doing what he said, he will give you victory. He will give you victory even when it makes no natural sense. So he had had enough. He had, God had prepared him in some of the small faith tests, right? Fleeces and, and boiling up rocks and all. He goes, okay. And then he says, now, Gideon, are you afraid? Gideon, he says, well, we're down to 300. <laughs> he says, so the Lord gives him a word of knowledge. So he, Gideon collects all the other guys' ram horns and all their stuff, right? He had an army of 32,000. You're down to 300. It's probably a lot of less, leftover stuff. Enough ram horns and torches and all that, right? That night, it says, the enemy was put, p- camped down in the valley. And that night, the Lord says, get up and go down to the Midianite camp. This is another action step. For I have given you victory over them. But if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. I don't know who this servant was, but the Lord, the Lord picks them. We need godly servants. God knows who's they are. They're the ones, they're the armor bearers who will walk with you. They're the Jonathans that go with David. They are not afraid. They will do things that like, I'm with you. 
something about Purah. There's no other account of him other than the Lord said, take him with you as a witness. Two, or, two shall establish. Let him be established by two or three witnesses. Listen to what the Midianites are saying that you will really be greatly encouraged and then you'll be eager to attack. So Gideon takes Purah. They go down to the edge of the enemy's camp. This is kind of wild. If you're afraid, go to the enemy's camp. That is not the place where you would naturally go to. Some of you are afraid of mission trips. You're afraid to go on the streets. You're afraid to minister in the house of mercy. You need to go to the enemy's camp. Hello? Come on, I'm speaking to somebody right here. This is, oh, I don't do that. Well, why don't you do that? Is it fear-based? Well, it's not my call. Okay, well, you talk to the Lord about it. But this place, it's like, go down to the enemy's camp because I want you to know what's going on. So when they get there, I love this prophecy. He says, when they get there, there are so many camels and so many people, it's like swarms of locusts, too many to even count. It's like sand on the seashore. I mean, can you imagine creeping up to a poor and getting there in the dark and like, oh my God, we got 300. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, it's like, good night. He says, just then, verse 11, he says, verse 33, 13, excuse me, Gideon creps up and the man is telling his companion. See the timing of this? He's telling his companion, I had a dream. And in this dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down on the Midianite camp. It hit the tent and turned it over and knocked it flat. His companion answered, your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite victory over the Midianites and his allies. That's a wild dream interpretation. A loaf of bread rolling down a hill means we're toast. I mean, I've heard some dream interpretation like, I, maybe I need to go back to dream interpretation school, but, but I want you to see something here. When you speak of your prophetic dreams and interpretation, the enemy listens and it scares the liver out of him. Because they didn't realize, oh, they're starting to get this, right? And so prophetic words, that's why we've been pressing into, we're going to become a prophetic community. We're pressing into it. Don't scoff at prophecy, right? The sons and daughters shall prophesy in the last days. And so we're not ashamed of that. It's, it's in the book. It's here. It's now. It's us. And so God, I pray, when he says, whoa, that can only mean one thing. So Gideon, he's like, yeah. He gets back to the other 298 guys says, we're going to have it. And the Lord gives him strategy. See, this is, when you have the word of the Lord, the timing and the strategy are as important as the word. Don't get them out of order, right? So look at what Gideon does. He says, he goes to the cases. Suddenly, he says, I'm going to go, I want you to do this. Here's the plan. I'm not sure how he got it, but he says, he says, go back. He divides his 300 men into groups and gave each one of them. So you got 100 in each. He says to them, keep your eyes on me. The timing is going to be important. When I blow the ram horn, you blow your horns all around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, the changing of the guard. So it is really dark. You ever been in the wilderness at night when there's no, when there's no moon? It is dark, right? And so... And they had divided, the Midianites had divided their army into two camps, two groups, right? Strategically, that's often what you do. So, and so he says he divides them, and it's midnight. At the changing of the guard, he takes his hundred men. They reach the corner of the Midianite camp. Suddenly, he blows the horn, right? They break the clay jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands, interesting, and the horns in their right hands, and it says, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And so what happens is each man stood in his position around the camp and panicked. Can you imagine changing the guard? You're asleep in your tent, and all of a sudden you hear, doo, 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 for the sword for Gideon and the Lord, a sword for Gideon and the Lord. And they go out there and there's lights and torches in three different locations, and they come flying out of their tent, sword striking, and, and they're killing anything that's right in front of them. 120,000 kill each other. I love that kind of battle. It's like, 
God took care. He's like, they came out and said, can you imagine fighting the dark in the shadow? There's somebody here right there, and it must be them. And in the morning, he realized, he just killed the whole army. That's wild. And Gideon and the guys are in the bushes watching the whole thing go down. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, what a, God, you're, gee, sha, ha. Anyway, so they panic. They get all, they start running. They cross the Jordan. And you got the two commanders, the two Midianite commanders in verse 25. The commanders, Oreb and Zeb, they're killed. When, when this starts happening, it's always wild. When the revival starts breaking out and the enemy's running, then the rest of the army, yeah, this is great. Let's get involved, right? So they come back. It says at that point, they, as they're hearing that, it was Gideon sends the warriors for Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh. Join us in the battle. So they send the messages. They come flying on the hills, and they catch the two commanders. Kill them. Now here's an interesting, chapter 8. It says, when the people of Ephraim ask Gideon, why did you treat us this way? Why didn't you call us earlier? See, now the victory's there, and they want to join in. This is the battle you fight after the battle you win. And the envy and the, yes, yes. we wanted to be part, and I love Gideon's response. In humility, he says, you killed the greatest commanders. What do we, he takes this humble approach instead of saying, well, God spoke to me. We did it with 300. He didn't, he didn't do any of that. He just takes, goes low. Come on now. This is a really good principle. Go low. You don't have to defend yourself. You can give people credit for what they did. Hey, you joined us in the fight. And he says that in chapter 8. He goes, then the people of Ephraim asked Gideon, why didn't you have us there? And a heated argument against Gideon. Gideon replies, what have I accomplished compared to you? Oh, boy. Aren't you even? I get the leftover grapes from Ephraim's harvest. God gave you the victory over Oreb and Zeb, the commanders of the army. What have I compared to you when I mean Ephraim, the head of Gideon? They're angry, so you, you're right. I, okay, yeah, we, yeah. Gideon then crosses the Jordan. Here's another thing. With the 300 men, they're exhausted. They, they've been up all night. They've been fighting all day. He chases the enemy. Look at this. Even though they were exhausted, they chased the enemy. There may be times when the enemy's in flight, and you just don't think you have anything left. And you just got to keep fighting. One foot in front of the other. There's a moment. You fight. I'm speaking to somebody. That's in your physical stuff, your finances, your health, your family. You got to just stand and fight. When you have nothing left to fight, Ephesians 6 says, you stand. There's something about standing in the fight, even when you're exhausted. Now it goes on. It says, you know, the, the tribe of Gad... He goes, he says, our, we're commanded, so we're tired. He goes in verse 6 of chapter 8. They stop at Succoth and they catch up and they said, give us some food. And they said, well, when you capture the two kings of the Amorites, then we'll give you food. Then he goes to the next village. He goes, my men, are, we're weary, we're after them, we're crossed over, we're after them. He says, this is the tribe of Peniel and um, the other tribe were part of Gad. So they're, they're part of the Israel. They would, they would benefit by the destruction of them. And yet they said, no, we're not going to feed your army until you come back and show us all the victory. The lesson here is don't expect people to come on board with you in the midst of the fight. Some people who, should, who would benefit by what they, they may withhold their blessing, they may withhold their prayer time, they may withhold themselves from being in the midst of it. Don't expect it. It's not a surprise. He says, okay, I'll tell you what. When I come back with the, with the heads of these two kings, I'm going to put thorns on your head, and I'm going to tear down your tower that you guys are all, you know, big about. And that's what he does. He says, so he goes after him. He goes, they, they go after him. It says they've not replenished. That's why these 300. This is the crowd that was willing to lay it all down in all the craziness of what doesn't look natural. These were the ones that says, we're with you. Give me 300 that are with you. Even when they're exhausted, they're with you. God can do something with people like that. And so he, they, they, sure enough, they go ahead, they cross over. There's only 15,000. Now, still, they've got 15,000 warriors. Verse 10, they'd already, 120,000 have already been killed. There's 15,000 left with the two kings, Zeba and Zaluma, right? So there's still 300 guys. They have 15,000. That's a lot. They get victory. 
And they come back, the long story here is, they come back, and because these kings had killed Gideon's brothers, he kills them, kills those kings. He had thought about them, he says, no, you've killed my brothers, therefore he kills them. He brings back, goes back to the two towns that didn't want to bless him, and he pays them back. <laughs> Just a reminder that uh, we've, we've done this. And then they want to make Gideon king. It says in, um, we want a king like you, verse 18. But you know what? You would think Gideon would say, wow, that's great, I'll make me a king. He goes, that's not what God's called me to do. He says, I'm not going to be your king. That's not who I am. But he makes a mistake. He says, I'll tell you what, I guess all the, they, they were into jewelry, these warriors, they had gold <laughs> earrings and stuff like that. In verse 27, Gideon says, I won't be your king, but I'll tell you what, uh, give, me a gold, give me a gold that, you, um, that you've gotten and you killed all these other warriors. And he's, I want to make a gold ephod. And what he does is he makes a pure gold breastplate and the people end up worshiping the breastplate. It was a symbol. I, I'm okay with symbols of victory. We have a box back there of places we've been in the earth, rocks and, and things of the revivals. But be careful that you don't worship that. You don't worship the history. You don't worship. Next, uh, on June 9th, we're going to talk, Pastor Mike, is one, his last Sunday here, he's going to talk about the history of the church and where we've come from. Because it's important to know where you've come from so you know where you're going. And so, but be careful that you don't worship that which was done in the past is some symbol, right? That idolatry really is costly. And it says they, they prostituted themselves and they worshiped the idol and it also became a trap for Gideon and his family. So be careful of that. And then it goes on, it says, as soon as, verse 33, as soon as Gideon and Israelites prostituted themselves again after Gideon dies, is 40 years of peace. For 40 years is peace. All right, I'm going to land this thing. It says, there's 40 years of that peace because God raised up a people who trusted him and they delivered the land into that place of peace. But it says, soon after, verse 34, they forgot the Lord their God and they did not show loyalty to the family of Jeroboam Baal, Gideon despite all that he had done. In fact, they come and they kill his family. The fickleness of people and the pursuing the wrong thing. Forty years is a generation. We've got to do well with the handoff to the next generation. And so that's why we're, we, we, if, you, if you're not volunteering in children's ministry, youth ministry, you might want to. We need what you have. This, you've got experiences that would really be good to pass on. And so we have to raise this up because 40 years from now, they don't remember. We, we don't remember a whole lot. So let's stand. I want to close here. and I want kind of just an impartation of the revelation. No matter how weak or disappointed you might be, with things, circumstances, the things that are and that you wish they were, something else, or God says in the weak areas of your life, or the areas where you've been tested, I, would lo I love what Leif Hetland said, it's the area where the serpent has bitten you in the past, it's the area where you will get your greatest authority if you let him. That's why those who struggle in addiction often once they're free become the advocates of power to stand against it those who have struggled with an abortion or brokenness or a failed marriage, they're the ones that can tell the ones when they would come to me and people would say, you don't know what it's like to have a disabled child. Or I said, well, I've had a brother and a daughter, so what do you mean? I can relate to where you're at. Tell me. We have a heart-to-heart -heart connection. Let's pray. So, Lord, I pray right now for that revelation, God, that no matter where we might be weak or feel f that we're really not where we need to be. You declare us heroes. But then, Lord, I ask that you tune us to pay attention to generational sin so that the legacy can be turned around. The immorality and the pursuit of things that are 
have no value in the kingdom. God, I ask for a revelation, a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Some of you are going to have dreams or visions. You're going to hear a sermon. You may even hear a secular song that will just like, whoa, God's speaking to me. This is a season of unprecedented revelation coming for those who will hear. But hearing requires obedience. So, Lord, I'm praying that you'll raise up a group of people who are not looking in the natural, but they're looking in the supernatural. God, I pray that we're going to see revelation to families. Just have a real strong sense that people you've prayed for for years, my wife and I have been praying for family members for years, some of them, that there's going to be a, a, a rapid acceleration that God is going to bring them in. Don't get weary in well-doing. When you're exhausted in the prayers, keep praying. Keep running the hill. But God, it's been so long. Keep running the hill. And when you say, I need somebody to stand alongside me, help me. Realize they may not come. But you and God and the few that are with you, they'll give you, the Lord will give you victory over that. Don't grow weary in well-doing. We keep, what does he says? Paul says, and grab hold with your weary hands. Straight path for you. Carve it out. That's in Hebrews 12. Carve out a straight path for you and walk this out. So, Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, as we have had a wonderful time with you of worship and revelation, God, I pray that you now anchor us. I ask you to send angels on assignment to the homes of these people, that they'll start to see things happen in their business places. God, they'll really be at pay attention to the unction of the Spirit. And we become the sheep that are listening and obeying. So God, I thank you. We bless their time together. Enjoy the holiday. Ministry team, if you'll come forward. If you're here this morning and you need prayer, don't leave here without it. I thank the Lord for the dedications that people that came and gave their life back to the Lord for breakthrough. Lord, there's no turning back. We're not going back. And I just thank you, Lord. May God bless you, keep you. We'll be here this Wednesday night, 6.30. I'm going to show a DVD from Dan McCollum on prophecy that I heard at Voice of the Prophets. And then we'll be off for the month of June on Wednesdays. But we'll be here. It'll be awesome. The next several Sundays are going to be awesome. So I just pray, God, to bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Thank you all for being here.